Hi everyone, today we're going over chapter 5 of biochemistry for the MCAT. This is a really short chapter, I think a lot of what's written in the book is just fluff and there's only a little bit of content that you actually need to know. Chapter 5.1 is about structural lipids. The most important one is the phospholipid because it makes up all of our cell membranes. Phospholipids are able to do this because they're amphiphilic um, or amphipathic, these mean the same thing. So it's called a phospholipid because it has this charged um, phosphate head group. So this is going to be very hydrophilic. Um, the charged head will be attracted to water. And on the other end, you have this very long hydrocarbon. It'll look more like this. And this long hydrocarbon is gonna be very hydrophobic. So this kind of structure where one part of it is hydrophobic and the other part is hydrophilic is known as amphiphilic. So when you have a whole bunch of these amphiphilic molecules inside an aqueous environment, such as your body, all of the hydrophobic tails will kind of aggregate toward each other because they're trying to get away from the water. In this way, they'll all face each other, while the hydrophilic head groups will turn out and face toward the solution. And so this is what forms all of our cell membranes. You probably knew this already, but this is one of the most important pieces of content in this chapter, that the surfaces of the bilayer in cell membranes is hydrophilic, while the inside is hydrophobic. Phospholipids can be either saturated or unsaturated. If it's unsaturated, it means that the hydrocarbon chain has single bonds only, and this means that they can pack closer, which means that the cell membranes will be more solid. An unsaturated fatty acid will have one or more double bonds in the hydrocarbon chain. So let's think about what happens when you start introducing double bonds here. So you can see that it can start to get a little wonky um, because double bonds can form in either cis or trans conformations. So you can pack a lot less of these unsaturated fatty acids in the same space that you can pack the saturated ones. This is true for all fatty acids, all the ones with really long hydrocarbon chains, not just for phospholipids. So for example, saturated fatty acids are what butter is made of. Um, so if you think of butter, it's very solid. All of the hydrocarbon chains are very closely packed together. And so they're very stable, they're very dense. Um, and so butter is a solid at room temperature. And on the other hand, olive oil or vegetable oil is made out of unsaturated fatty acids. The chains are kind of wonky. Um, they don't pack very closely together. They're very fluid. The point of all of this is if you get a question um, about like boiling points or melting points and one of the chains has a double bond in it and the other one does not, the one with the double bond is going to have the lower melting point. So it's going to be a liquid at a lower temperature. I could have explained that much faster, but there's so little content in this chapter, I just want to drill the important points in. And then the chapter goes into a lot of subclassifications of phospholipids. Um, it's very intimidating and frankly unnecessary. These are the ones that I think might be useful to kind of know. If something has the prefix glycero, that means glycerol is going to be somewhere in it. This here is glycerol. If you have a glycerophospholipid, it's going to have a phosphate group as the head. You probably should know what glycerol looks like, and all you need to know is that if you have glycerol and you slap a phospho and then you have some lipids coming out of it, that's a glycerophospholipid. On your phosphate head, you also have an extra attachment point. This could be anything. Um, so if this was whatever, then this would be a glycerophospho whatever lipid. If something has a sphingo prefix, that means they have a sphingosine backbone. How I would go about recognizing this is that if your fatty acid chain has some nitrogen hanging off of it near the head, that's probably a sphingolipid. Um, so an important sphingolipid is the sphingomyelin, and it forms the kind of fatty acid sheath for axons. I could see that fact coming up in some way. Waxes are also in this chapter. Um, they are fatty acids. Chapter 5.2 is about signaling lipids. So terpenes are precursors to a lot of signaling lipids. They're generally made out of isoprene, which looks like this. One class of signaling lipids are steroids. So steroids act as hormones. They travel through your blood. They signal to different parts of your body. One good example of a steroid is cholesterol, and cholesterol lives in the phospholipid bilayer. Maybe lives in is the wrong word. Is in 
the phospholipid bilayer cholesterol is necessary to keep your cells fluid. It's definitely in other places as well. I'm not a biologist, I'm also not a doctor, so I'm not going to tell you more about cholesterol in case I'm wrong. What I do know is that steroids generally look like this with the four rings. Um, this is a structure that would kind of remind you of a sugar or maybe DNA, so if you see this, it's not that, it's actually a lipid and it's a steroid. Prostaglandins are also signaling lipids. Um, people thought they were made by the prostate gland and it turns out they're not. They're just a regular signaling lipid. I do think it's important to memorize which vitamins are fat soluble and which ones are not. Um, so A, D, E, and K are all fat soluble and that leaves B and C as water soluble. The mnemonic I used was a bleep in that fat bleep. Um, I don't know why I heard it once and I just never forgot it. So maybe now you will also never forget that A, D, E, K, a deck is fat soluble. And A is carotene and it's good for eyesight. Vitamin D is good for bone growth. Um, I think maybe good is a strong word here. It's like if you don't have these, then you won't have eyesight and you won't have bone growth. Chapter 5.3 is about energy storage. So energy in the form of fat in your body is stored in triglycerols. These are hydrophobic as many other lipids are. They're called triglycerols because here you have glycerol and here you have three fatty acid chains. Saponification is the process of creating soap from a fatty acid. So let's say you have a triglycerol and you added some base to it. This would then get you your glycerol back and here your fatty acid chain is now a soap. By soap, I mean a surfactant. So a surfactant works to lower water surface tension and this makes some things that are regularly not water soluble, water soluble. Like if you have some greasy dishes you need to wash, you can't get it off with just water, you need to add a soap and the soap basically forms a micelle around all of the hydrophobic things that you can't get off otherwise. This is a micelle. Basically, your soap particles will be amphiphilic, so they can do this, and then your greasy things will sit right in the middle there and they'll get lifted out. So yeah, that's it for this chapter. Um, if this is the one you decided to do today, then congrats, you're already done. It was really quick and easy.